Great. My name is Gustav Nissan Kotte, and I work as a senior software engineer at uh, IKEA Retail, Inca Group. And uh, I want to start this session by very briefly describing the IKEA.com web platform. And uh, then I will take a deep dive in an opportunity that we see in the platform around scaling up A-B testing. And after that, I'll talk about some dynamic responses and edge computing, and then going forward. But first, IKEA has 474 stores in 64 different countries. And IKEA Retail, Inca Group, where I work, operates 392 of these stores. IKEA's vision is to create a better everyday life for the many people. And Inca Digital is responsible, responsible for serving over 4 billion online customers worldwide. And 25% of the sales are on, happening online. We are 3,500 digital professionals in eight growing digital hubs, uh, such as uh, some of them in South and Sweden, in Amsterdam, in Madrid, in Philadelphia, Shanghai, and Bangalore. And we are a multi-CDN and multi-cloud organization. When, develop an, when, de when developing and operating a website of this scale, uh, we need to make sure that it's secure, available, performant, and indexed and ranked high in search engines. For example, the core Web Vitals performance metrics need to be all green, and good web performance is necessary for a good user experience. IKEA.com is developed by 50 teams from Inca Digital. The web platform enables collaboration and reusability between the teams by using fragments small portions of HTML that we then compose by using either edge side includes on the server side or Ajax or Fetch on the client side. IKEA.com also uses a static files architecture and we have over 40 million files in use. These files enable both static sites and JavaScript single page applications and components. And from a super high level perspective, we have a content delivery network on top that fetches files from a static file storage at the public cloud provider. Super simple. The static sites uh, then is taking, are taking 66% 66 of the traffic. Uh, and that's great because static content and static sites make it so much easier to get security, availability, good web performance, and also makes it really easy for search engines to find our content. So that's great. However, this st static file architecture also introduces some challenges. So we don't call these problems. We may be in a bit cheesy way, but I think it's really, it's really nice. We call them opportunities, because that's what they are. And so we are very curious about these opportunities. Um, so IKEA was founded in Sweden, in Småland, in 1943. And if you go even further back in time, in the 19th, 1900th century, the soil when, for farmers contained a lot of rocks. And the, the rocks needed to be constantly pulled up the ground and moved. and required a lot of work in order to farm. And then new rocks constantly popped up after each winter. That's just how the, how the land was. So these rocks were then used uh, as mark for the boundaries between the land of different farms. And they look quite beautiful. And there's all, the, the rocks then are also some kind of symbol for, for where IKEA come from, from the culture and environment from that time. So that environment like, also created a culture of really togetherness and a bit of stubbornness around solving challenges and also a really strong entrepreneurial spirit to get, to get more with less and never give up. Because that's basically what was necessary at that time to survive. So, going back to our time and A-B testing, um, we want to improve customer value and be able to measure it by using customer-centric metrics and that is not straightforward. 
So therefore, we need to improve the way we measure. There's a lot of change going on in the site every day, 50 teams deploying. It's, it's very hard to know what causes what. So we want to slice the data and, and have this everything else equal. This is the change, and this is the metric change um, to bring basic, basic causality into the system. So we want to scale A-B testing practices and grow the experimentation culture within Inca Digital. Um, and yeah, this would be really hard to do without A-B testing. A-B testing gives us better data faster and allows us to attribute changes we do to changes in metrics. And we also want to do this in a web performant way to not lose that great property of the site. We especially don't want to increase cumulative layout shift, CLS. So we'll look at CLS soon, but first like, let's take a quick uh, deep dive into A-B testing and uh, deterministic bucketing. Just a quick hand, how many know about A-B testing here? <laughs> Almost everyone, that's nice. How many know about deterministic bucketing? A few. Great, so there's a gap to fill here. So A-B testing and deterministic bucketing. So if you have a user ID, you can take uh, that ID and concat that with an experiment name. You then take a hash function like murmur3, which is really fast, and you get a long integer, uh, positive or negative, and that's the hash value. Then you mod that with 100, and you get a number between 0 and 99, which looks like a percentage um, number. And then you look at that value. If that value is below a certain, certain threshold, say I want 10% of the audience in B, then if, if the value is less, then the audience gets, the request gets B, otherwise A. So um, in this case, we get 18, and since 18 is less than 20, uh, we get B. And if B is a different text, a different color, a different component, a different page, a different site. It's, there are some statistical nuances to, to what you test, um, and there's a lot of traps. But this is like the core. This is the screw of this big site, one of the screws, one really important detail. So the, ter the determinism in this, like if I have a user ID, it doesn't matter if I'm on the web, if I'm on the native app, if I'm on the store, if I'm in the store. Because, so we can have cross-channel, omni-channel A-B tests with deterministic hash bucketing. And also, it makes it really easy to uh, reproduce A-B tests, because if you give me your user ID, if that maybe you have a bug, you experience a bug, I can test that and set the, your user ID to mine and reproduce. <laughs> so today we have static sites, as I said, and how does A-B testing work with static sites on the, then in the browser? Because the files are just there. We can't do, really much, do a lot with them. So there's basically three patterns, and I think the top two are mostly used. So you have your A in a static file, the, the normal site, the what everyone sees. And then you replace that with B on the client side. Or you have A and B in a static file, and then you toggle between them. Or you say, we have nothing, and we render everything client-side. Um, and these are the options I see with such static files. The question then becomes, what is the developer experience with this, these patterns? And what happens with the cumulative layer shift and also flickering? So. Let me show you an A-B test uh, on the, in the client side, causing some CLS. <laughs> so we will here refresh the browser. And with zero CLS, you should see no elements bouncing around. And maybe you saw it, there's, there's a lot of elements bouncing around. Um, the upper limit for good CLS is 0 0.1. Um, and bad CLS starts with 0 0.25, and this particular page had 0 0.26 uh, when we had this flickering. So this is what we don't want. 
this is both hurting actually search engine optimization because Google takes uh, CLS and the other core vitals into account when ranking. So it's both bad from an SEO perspective, but also, of course, super bad from a user experience perspective. So this makes it hard to do A-B testing, basically, on the client side. <laughs> so let's look at the developer experience as well. So what is developer experience? Sorry, wrong button. Developer experience is basically user experience for developers. And bad UX leads to longer time to complete tasks, and it's easier to make mistakes. Users become frustrated or unhappy, and they start maybe looking for alternatives and eventually leave. And bad UX can also ca ca even cause brand damage. And the same reasoning goes for developer experience. Like We want our, all our developers to be able to do a, as a good job as possible. And it's kind of hard already, so we need to provide really good tools and methods to our developers. So it's a bit like this, that static sites and client-side uh, development are two very different web uh, development paradigms. And so in order for, for teams to get learnings from A-B tests, they have to like, go over the river to the client side and do some learnings there, and then bringing that learnings back to the original place where they developed the, developed the site. And by the way, going here also causes a lot of problems with cumulative layer shift and, and flickering things happening, uh, bad things happening for a customer, basically. So it becomes a really hard thing to do. And this is what we would like to scale up. And that's a problem because we want a thing, but we don't want the bad consequences of it. So we need to rethink, and this is an opportunity. So what if we instead, instead had something more, like not static, but actually more dynamic responses uh, for the website? So moving logic somewhere, so that customers could get like, different HTML responses from the server, depending on, for example, yeah, if they're then bucketed in different A-B tests. Then the elements will, would not bounce around and cause cumulative layout shift because the HTML is already fully constructed on the server side. It's just that different customers get different responses, but they all get a good experience, a good performance. And it also would be in the same development paradigm as, as today. <laughs> or rather, we will shift from static to dynamic. So we then could introduce some dynamic compute illustrated with a bicycle between the CDN and static file storage as an option to get this property. Then three quick rendering patterns. We could then, in a static file, which has a div, my component, in the dynamic compute, run the AB bucketing, and if we are in B, we then render the B component to B text, and with some parsing, find the component and replace the HTML with this new version. <laughs> or we could have a static file containing more like template code, for example, handlebars or mustache or, yep. And then if we are in, a, in an experiment B, or an experiment with a bucket B, we would just render this component and else we would render the A component. And, this, and, the, dynamic and the dynamic code would be to run the bucketing and then run the templating library with the context of what the actual buckets are. Or we could say the static files are now not HTML, but JSON, and we will use this as a data source for our, for our rendering. So we run our bucketing, and 
we then render with maybe Preact as a rendering library, and as usual, with the JSON data and um, the buckets that we got. So then, if we then go back to our client side patterns, like, okay, so we can either replace something, or we could double render and pick them, or we could have nothing and then either render A or B, and this was really kind of not great. It's not, it's, it's not great for developer experience. It's not, it's not safe, and it's actually not, it's not fair to ask, to, to have this ask. If we move these three patterns to the server side, they become really good, depending on what you, what you want. You can either render uh, and, and overwrite with a parser, or use a templating solution, or just render HTML from JSON with a static JSON file. So what was previously bad on the client side becomes good on the server side. So yes, we want this dynamic compute. Can we get it? How can we get it? So what we then want from this dynamic compute, since we have, um, since the website is global, and we have we're present in this in this many countries, it needs to be a global distributed compute. We don't want any HTTP requests to kind of crossing the Atlantic on every page view. So it needs to be at least in every continent. And you know, the closer the the compute is to the customer, the better it gets until you get the cache hit problem. So it's not, it's a trade-off. But it's nice to be able to, to play with that trade-off. Oh, of course, it's also, the compute also needs to be performant in itself. And it has to have a great developer experience. And also scale to the many teams from a management and governance perspective. And that's may maybe what you would call the en enterprise property. That it needs to scale from a back office or practical uh, practical perspective. So, our static files architecture kind of democratized web development. I've been working with Akira.com for almost seven years, and I was there when we started this, the static files movement, we say. And it has grown from a single team to three teams to five teams to 50 teams. And there, it's, it's no longer a problem to, to deploy and to have operations on Akira.com because it's just static files. It is like the most simple thing, and it's the web development as in the 90s, but today. So how can we kind of keep that property? How can we democratize something that is actually much harder so that front-end teams can get dynamic compute without like doubling in size because they had now have so much more responsibility. And I think one of one of these answers is edge computing. So then what is it? How many know about edge computing already? A few hands. Okay, great. So in a website context, edge computing means that a large number of nodes have a kind of serverless style operating model. And the developers can then treat these nodes as a single network. So for example, deployments and configuration management are global. It's just a network that you operate on. You don't know or actually care about um, what nodes are there. And that's also a dynamic property of the network. So then if teams need to deploy something more global they, or more local, because you don't always want global deploys. You can use feature flagging and conditionals and kind of segment your deploy in, in code, basically, and configuration. Edge computing also like scales down, scales up and down seamlessly, often with really small cold start times. And it means that teams don't have to worry themselves about the distribution of their compute. 
and I don't have a care to care about the consolidation of my metrics and signals either. It is a global network of compute, and you deploy and you get metrics from that. And I think that, and that's great. Another option would be that we build this global network of compute internally as a platform, and that will be like more work for us, and it will require really talented people to have this as a, operating as a platform. And we would like these people to work on other things if possible. So edge computing allows us to give, to kind of get this, get this property off the shelf. It's not a silver bullet, but maybe it can work for our problem of, uh, of generating HTML. So if modern cloud computing went from like, you know, pets to cattle, you know, you don't, you go from naming a pet, you have a name, or cattle, you don't have a name, you have a number, then edge computing is more like going from a cattle to a cattle herd that you don't know how many they are really, or you just treat them as one, one network. So we are quite early with, um, with edge, comp edge computing. We're thinking really big and then also starting small because that's, a, that's what we believe in is a good way to actually give early feedback, early learnings and early results and we build on that. So I want to show you two examples uh, that is already in production today. Not related to A-B tests, but we will build on this foundation uh, for production later. We have things in our development pipeline, but it's yeah, not ready for production yet. So our financial services team develops a product that uh, lets our customer do partial payment. And due to the nature of static files and also underlying system requirements, they needed to create around a million files per market to display this text with uh, the monthly costs. When they th then migrated to edge computing and then using JavaScript and Preact at the edge, it allowed them to completely, completely remove the static files and instead render the, render the result dynamically at the edge. And the average compute time per request is 10 milliseconds. Another team is uh, the Geomagical team who has a product called Creative, Creative in Swedish. It's an uh, AI-powered virtual and mixed reality room design tool. So originally, this web frontend was written as a single page application and still is. But when the team needed to do some uh, and support social media sharing uh, to the product, they encountered some challenges because when you share, you want a preview of what you share. And this preview is personal. It's the design of what you want to share. It's not a, it's not a stock image, stock photo image. It's, it's what the thing that you created. And that doesn't fit the single page application uh, model because you need metadata, met, metadata tags to point to the, to the image for the preview. And there's no such thing in a single page application. So what the team did was instead to proxy their single page application uh, HTML file with edge compute and basically do a little mashup of finding the, the, pre, the, the necessary information and add these few metadata tags to the HTML page so that uh, a preview could be displayed. So going back here, this work was maybe a, a few weeks, but this work was a few days, two to three days of development with a global distributed compute so that, um, because before it was just a static file and that is, if we it's really easy to, to distribute. But when we do compute, suddenly it becomes an operational problem. But this was two to three days of work deployed to Edge, and then suddenly you have 
you have your dynamic compute globally distributed. This was written in Rust, and it has a three and a half millisecond average compute time. So that's what we have in production today with edge computing. Then going forward, and this will kind of be the, the real opportunity part of, of our exploration. So if we look at A-B testing and personalization, we kind of see that they have this, the same shape in a bit fluffy, fluffy way to say it. So A-B testing takes the user ID and give, returns a list of buckets for that user ID that we can then use for different HTML variants for different requests. And soft personalization, which will be like, it's not you, it's like your type. Maybe it is based on your um, where in the country you are. For example, Texas is a lot different than Alaska. So maybe you want to display different things uh, at IKEA there. Or maybe if you, if you have a, a IKEA for business customer, maybe you want to display prices without VAT and have maybe different, um, different content. So, and there are man, many more examples of like personalization buckets, you might say, that we could um, act on. So this becomes like a relevancy problem that how can we be as relevant as possible on Akira.com if we know a little bit more about who you are and what you, what you want to do? And it's also the same thing if you go to a store multiple times and the same people recognize you, you're not anonymous anymore. You go, hey, welcome back. How, how's, your, how's your kitchen project going? So it's kind of a more, you, it's not a reset journey every time you come back. You can actually come back to the same state of the of the work that you have have started. So yeah, today uh, Akira.com is essentially the same for everyone, regardless of where the customer is in their journey, and we want to change that because one size does not fit all customers. So then, the problem, or I would say opportunity, is that the user ID gets transformed in a, not a random way, but a, it looks random, but it's the same for every, every, you give it a seed and it's the same value every time. And that's based on configuration. But this user ID in, in personalization needs to actually have this user's data and it becomes more a data scalability problem. And I think this is super inter interesting because the next phase that we see is coming with edge computing is actually edge data, where you have a globally distributed data set that edge computing can use so that you don't have to go down. You have, this, they have the exact same problem you don't want your edge compute to cross the Atlantic to fetch some data. So you're just shifting the problem. So what if we instead had the data at the edge as well? Then we could go from a user ID to a something that we can act on and create HTML variants of. <laughs> so yeah, we, we have many customers and they are, very di they are diverse and we want to do something uh, with that opportunity. And that being said, like diversity is a feature, it's not a bug. So at IKEA and at Inca Digital and Inca, we take diversity and inclusion super serious as a company. And we want our coworker base to be as diverse as the world. And, and also we want to be as inclusive as the world should be. So this is the only way for us to truly reflect, understand, and serve the many people. 
and then also how we build digital solutions and products, period. And this is because our vision is to create a better everyday life for the many people. Right, some key takeaways. So we want to scale up A-B testing and also personalization. And we don't want to scale up the problems associated with it. So therefore, Akira.com needs to go from a static site to be more dynamic. And we think that edge computing is one tool in the toolbox for becoming more dynamic. And at IKEA, we see problems as opportunities, and we are very curious about them. And I see that I have quite a lot of time for questions. So thank you. <laughs> Any questions? I have a mic here somewhere. Mic. Yeah, and I can repeat the question. I don't need a mic, uh, I realized. So, um, so I can't be too specific. So what we, as I said before, we are a multi-CDN and multi-cloud company. And what we have started with is edge computing at the CDN layer. So different CDN providers like Akamai, Fastly, or, and uh, other CDM providers have this edge computing. Um, yeah, I forgot the name of the third one that I'm. Uh, Cloudflare. Yeah, they all have edge computing capabilities, and there are other other CDMs as well. But they have a large number, really large number of uh, of nodes, uh, ranging from hundred to. Yeah. Large. Cool. Any more questions? All right, thank you so much. <laughs>